Welcome to I Finally Get It. This week we have Ron Prejean, an entrepreneur here in Lafayette. Joining me in studio as always, Dustin Webb, our producer. I'm your host, Jeff Martin. Let's get it. I guess what I finally got a few years ago is I uh, I realized what I was supposed to be in, in my career mm-hmm. and quit looking for other things to do. I think that was my... My get it moment, really, probably 20 years ago, maybe. Wow. I met you one time when I was doing a workshop for your company. Right. And I shared with you that you you gave me a light bulb moment. I had been looking at my career as a business coach the entire time. My goal, and it still is, to help business owners get out of the day-to-day so they can actually grow their companies. And you said to me, I didn't start making money till I quit working. That's right. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, that is what I do. That is how I help people. There's actually a little more to it than, yeah. than that, that. But what I really meant was if you're a professional person, a CPA like I was or an engineer or a lawyer, and if you really want to build a business, you have to, you have to learn to let go and to somehow let other people work for you. That's right. And with you. Otherwise, you run out of hours in the day and and you just get bogged down doing work, the technical work, and you just can't grow the business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's really what worked for me. That's what worked for you. And that's the that's the business I'm in. And so so tell me how it came to be that you figured that out. You, you know what I mean? What were you doing? I at think the time? it was out of frustration. We you know, we had a nice size CPA firm, as most local firms do. We do you know, did a lot of everything, accounting, tax work. Inevitably during what we call tax season, which is primarily February, March, April, I'd get so bogged down looking at files that I had to work on. Yeah. And it you know, just get really frustrated and, and, and down and finally realize there's gotta be a better way. And I had a good staff. We had had good partners. We each had our strengths and weaknesses. And I realized that my strength was not the technical aspects of what I did. I was I was a decent accountant, but I wasn't rattling off code sections and things like that. But I was a pretty good salesman. Thought I was a pretty good manager. I probably wasn't, but I thought I was. So I just realized one day that, you know, this is going nowhere. I'm working 14, 16 hour days. Don't seem to be getting ahead work wise. And I'm working longer and later than some of the people who are working for me. So let's let's try something different. And that's that was kind of the What was the first thing you did? Started pushing work down to people who delegate. Delegating to people. I realize if you're hiring good people and if you hire them then they're, they're supposed to be good, then you've got to trust them and you have to give them an opportunity to make mistakes and to grow. That's a real problem in our profession is that a lot of CPAs are just caught up with, you know, only I can do something right. And therefore, I'm not going to waste my time trying to teach somebody because they'll just screw it up anyway. The truth is, it's every profession. It's every I profession. I mean, it's crazy it really out there. Yeah. yeah, we all make mistakes. I, you know, I still make mistakes. But you, you just have to learn to let go and to trust people, to motivate them and to, and to you know, supervise them, mentor them, do all the things that they need to have done you know, if they're going to be, uh, be successful. Yeah. So your base business was a CPA firm. How'd you get into accounting and all? I got into accounting, went to UL, USL at the time, grew up in rain down the road, went to USL, started out as a marketing major, actually, and took the first accounting course and did well in it and liked it. So I took the second course and did well in it. Then I started looking around and the marketing majors, the, the graduates, most of them are going to work selling life insurance or <laughs> you know selling Sell to each something. other, basically. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, the accounting profession was really lucrative, and still is. But uh, the accounting graduates were being recruited by what was the big eight CPA firms then. IRS was a great career. There, there were a lot of opportunities. So I just decided then I'm just going to stick with this and, and see where it takes me. You know, kind of never look back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it turned out to be the right choice. As it turns out, I ended up being the marketer for my businesses anyway, kind of going full circle. You didn't waste any time in marketing. You didn't waste <laughs> any time. Back. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, and I know you've relatively recently sold your, your firm, so I, I guess you're not missing tax season right no, now. Huh? No, no. <laughs> uh, but t- to be honest, I haven't done a lot of tax work in the last 15, 20 years. 
personally following that advice that I give that to you, other people. Would, correct, correct. Don't try to do it all yourself. It's, it's been a nice surprise, really, because I never thought I would retire. Yeah. I always felt and told my friends and colleagues that I'll never retire. It's, you know, I have got a feeling you do. never will retire, though. No, and I've gotten interested and involved in some other things that keep me busy. And it's been a very nice surprise and a welcome change in my life. I've got four grandkids who all live here, and they're all in school and in athletics, so we get to follow them around and not miss out on any yeah, uh, huge. activities. It is huge. As I tell people, I think grandparenting is a second chance to be a parent again. That's right. That's uh, right. That's great. Although my children, I probably resent that to some extent because <laughs> we probably overparent sometimes, but yeah, yeah. it's a real, uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to do that and follow these kids along their trajectory in life. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know overparent. I guess you can, but we just try to do the best we can. That's all. Yeah. Well, you know, when we're young, you think that you, your career is so important and it's everything. So you miss out on a lot of things with your own children. You know, like, you know, there'll always be another softball game. There'll always be another track meet. I'll, I'll catch that one. And you look back one day, you realize I missed out on a lot of those things that meant a lot to the, the children, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you miss out on making a lot of memories. Yeah. And yeah. that's... Well, that you know, that's another... Uh, light bulb moment if you will yes it, you know take the time when you're in the the grind of it and and go to your kids exactly. games and do all that exactly yeah, i love that yep so let, let me ask you this this is a little bit personal my i have a son that went up to louisiana tech and major in professional aviation okay pilot instrument rating yep. and all that fun stuff he just changed to accounting. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so what what is the best advice you could give him? He's taking his first accounting classes now. You know, he can always he can always be a pilot. Yeah. But accounting and all his grandson has decided he wants to be an accountant. He's gonna to go to LSU in the fall. Accounting is just a good basic curriculum to 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 follow. You you learn a lot of good skills, not only accounting wise and debits and credits, but you know you're exposed to a lot of business law and economics and finance and different things. There's no wasting an accounting background, in my I, opinion. I agree 100. percent A lot of attorneys have backgrounds and, and degrees, undergraduate degrees in accounting. You're exposed to a lot of different things, and you know there are so many different career choices you can make. You don't have to go into public accounting as I did. You can work for the government. You can work in industry. You can go into financial services. There are just a lot of opportunities. Yeah, and I bet there are a lot of opportunities to partner with businesses. You know, if you're working with companies, have you ever had an opportunity to work with somebody and then kind of become a partner oh, yeah, in that company? Yeah. In fact, my my retirement is largely based on the investments I made with clients, potential clients, et cetera, during my career. I gotcha. wish they all had turned out to be successful, but you know, you make mistakes, particularly yeah, sure. when you're young yeah. and invincible. And I certainly made my uh, share of mistakes and investments. Again, as I progressed through the career and became, became a little more uh, mature maybe, mm -hmm. and spent a little more time analyzing opportunities and making sure they were opportunities and not, not pitfalls. I was pretty successful in, in doing a couple of those things. You know, real estate, you see a lot of opportunities. I'm in the medical profession in, in a medical lab that I'm involved in. One of my colleagues and I actually helped put the, the business together. That's fantastic. For some physicians. Yeah. And yeah. they allowed us to invest in it and it's grown to, into a nice company now. So we're enjoying that. So yes, your you're given a lot of uh, opportunities, particularly in the, in the public accounting realm, which is where I was. Because yeah, I bet. you're helping people. Uh, a lot of people have great ideas, have good business plans, but don't have the capital mm -hmm. to do it along along by themselves. And that gives you opportunities to uh, to invest yourself, yep. as well as maybe some other people who look to you to to bring them opportunities. So, so a lot of those opportunities do do those clients of yours come to you in a in an advisory capacity or is just because you're 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 engaged with them and so they look at you as a trusted advisor yeah, it, my practice was somewhat unique and probably 75 percent of our clients were professionals physicians dentists it. engineers architects so we were doing basic accounting functions for them and tax work i have this saying that i didn't get uh, I've got very little accounting work from my friends, yeah. but most of my clients became friends. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. And and that 
leads to a, a level of trust and objectivity. So, uh, you know, physicians, for example, are always given opportunities to to do something, yeah, yeah. and likely, uh, usually, they'll come to you and say, "What do you think about this?" And you know, you'll give them as good of advice as you can. And if if it sounds like something that really makes sense, and you get excited about it, they see it, and they'll and many times say, well, "Why don't you get in in this thing with me?" Yeah, that's good. That's uh, huge. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. As I said, but yeah, you are you are you know accountants generally, and all of the the surveys show this. We are the most trusted advisor to most people, to business people. Uh, that makes sense to me. Tell me about one of those uh, those deals that worked out well for you that you've loved being a partner with. Well, real estate. Uh, I was I was. Uh, given the opportunity to participate in some fairly significant real estate investments. Uh, you know, back in the 80s when the economy tanked here, you know, uh, the banks were going under like crazy. Several of us and all of us professionals, well, we able, were able to buy some properties from what was then the RTC, the Resolution Trust, Trust Corporation. Corporation. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, at the time, none of us had any money. So we had to borrow the money to buy these properties at a really attractive price. Yeah. In fact, this one particular property we bought that we're still holding on to about 35 years later. Wow. And we're now, now in the process of, of probably selling because most of the owners are like me. We're older and we're suffering life events, deaths of spouses, uh, uh, successions, things like that. So it's time to, to let go. So real estate has probably been my most favorite opportunity that I've gotten involved in. I don't think I've ever lost money in real estate. Uh, although you can if you try, you sure, uh, you sure can. Some of the bad investments I made. I was I was a pioneer in the video store business, which didn't turn out very well. Uh, it it had its tur- time though, it right? It had its time. Our timing was wrong. Got it. We 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 just missed it. Uh, we were pre blockbuster. Yep. Oh wow. In fact, I, I, the epiphany for me came when we had. Some friends of our of mine, we invested in like six different stores: uh-huh. Baton Rouge, Eunice, uh, Slidell. They, were they the same brand? But but the, yes, it was uh, a local okay. franchise. Got it. And one day I was driving on Kali Saloon Road at the corner of Kali and Pinhook. There's a um, a Walgreens there now. At one time it was a Chevron service station, and I looked up and I saw a sign that says "Free Videos" with the tank up, and I'm like. Yeah, this is done. not working. It's done. Yeah. It's done. It's, it's done. So that w- that's one of the bad things that that happened to me. Again, uh, and and you mentioned epiphanies. I finally realized after a few years that every time I made a bad investment, what enabled me to to pay for it was my accounting profession. Yeah. So I finally realized, you know what. This is what you're supposed to be doing. There, there's another another light bulb. It's another light bulb. You, you know, you have a base business that funds the opportunities as they come up, and you have an educated guess or what's going to work, what's exactly. what's not. And, and again, the video worked. It was just bad timing. Bad timing. I'll, yeah. I'll never forget going by that exact same corner and looking at that Walgreens and seeing a red box. Do you remember yes. that? Yes. Yes. Well, that was that was after yep. videos after Blockbuster, and I said. That's not going to work. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and then they they had their day. Yeah. You know, but now everybody's streaming everything. That's just like I think Blockbuster, which was a huge success, yeah. finally went out of business. Yep. I think they turned down buying Netflix. Yeah, they did. For they did. like, I don't know, a few million dollars. For, for, yeah, pennies. Yeah. And then, but they regret that, I'm sure. Yep. A lot of that I, I look into as ego. You know, they... they they think they had it their way and it was the right way to do it. And they couldn't let their ego make that yeah. purchase for some That's reason. Right. Yep. I, do we, we do that in just local business too, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I guess you've seen a little bit of everything. I've seen a lot. And um, what I, again, like to tell people is in, in business, I don't know all the good guys, mm-hmm. but I know most of the bad guys. <laughs> you know, because I've been laugh yet for – this year, I should get my 50th uh, anniversary certificate from the State Society of CPAs. Oh, wow. I still keep my license. You do keep your license? Oh, yeah. All your CPAs and all that? Uh, so, you know, I've been around long long enough to, to yeah. see a lot of mistakes and a lot of opportunities. And sometimes you shake your head and like, how did this guy do that? It's, or it's why amazing. did that guy do that? Yeah. It's been fun. It's, it's uh, you know, of course, Lafayette is such a dynamic 
small town, yeah. small city. Yeah, it is. Yep. That you know, we've been through the ups and downs, the the Arab oil embargo of the seventies and the crash of the eighties, and and another thing I, I learned is that if you have a profession, even in a town like Lafayette that goes through the downturns, you're going to make a living. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Uh, as I tell young people, if you're reasonably intelligent. And you show up for work on time every day. Usually works out. Another light bulb. Another light bulb. We're gonna keep. <laughs> we're gonna keep going. It is so true. And and today it's the weirdest thing in the world. It is very hard to find people today. And all all the clients of mine that coach, their people problems are the things that are really really eating yeah. them up. You, you know, that's and, exactly uh, what it is. It's just it's a weird time to be alive i think some of that is my generation spoiling our kids yeah and probably giving them too much and not making them work for it yeah so i take part of the blame for that i used to tell my kids this might be a light bulb for you you know they'd ask for something and my comeback was how can you need something that did not exist five years ago Correct. That's, that's so not true. A need. That's a want. Yeah, that's a want. And there's a big difference. You know, one of the quotes that I love is Shaquille O'Neal. His kids wanted something and they came to him and they said, but daddy, we're rich. He said, baby, we're not rich. I'm rich. That's right. <laughs> and that's so exactly I, right. I love he's not. I, hopefully, I'm sure he is spoiling them a little bit, but we've got to do better. You know, but but they they also say that every generation, we just want our kids to do better than yes. we did. But we're. It's, we may not be preparing them for life exactly. by giving them what they got. I have two adult daughters, who both well-educated and have done well or doing well. But I always told them the gap between the haves and the have-nots is very wide. It is. And you just want to make sure you're one of the haves. It doesn't mean wealth or anything other than watch out for yourself, take care of yourself, get an education, keep your head above water and, and do the right thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you could end up like some of these others who have nothing. What I'm hearing from you is it's about being in position. Just like you're saying, like you had a profession and it was your base business and it afforded you these other opportunities. These kids just need to they need to be in position yes. to win. And then that's part of the half. So I think that's exactly right. You, yeah. And you have to work. You have yeah. to, you, you gotta. Nothing comes easy. Yep. The self-made millionaires, uh, overnight success stories. Those, those are rare. Yeah. And, you know, usually if you look into someone's background who is successful, they worked hard and, and, you know, instant, Success might have taken 10 years or 15 yeah, that's, years. That's exactly right. I hope they're charging for the 10 years and not just for today. Exactly. The, exactly. Who's big, you, been your biggest inspiration in your life so far? You know, it's interesting because of probably 30 years ago, remember David Letterman? Yes, sir. Had the top 10. Mm -hmm. I uh, One day I was just, I don't know, sitting at my computer and I said, I'm going to make my own top 10 list. And- of people who influenced me and served as either role models or mentors to me. And I did, I probably spent a couple of hours putting it together and I actually sent it to each one of those 10 people. The first person on my list was my father. Mm. My father was definitely a blue collar guy. He and his brother were home builders from brain, got a GED later in life, but you know, just a hard worker. Eventually he got a job selling brick for a local company because he became friends with the owner of the company who would call on him to sell him brick for his jobs and told my father, you know, you, you, you could do better than this. You could do something else. So he took the jump. In fact, what I say in my little blurb is my father was an, was an entrepreneur, but didn't know it. Yeah, correct. He just, he's just correct. a hard worker yeah. and took care of his family. I have three siblings that I remember while he was building, and we lived in rain, but the market was here in Lafayette. He was building houses. And I remember I was probably in the seventh grade, and my father uh, said, we have to have a, a family meeting. So we did, and he said, and, and he was devastated. He and his brother had like two spec houses that we just weren't selling because of the economy. He says, your mom and I are going have to have to mortgage our house to pay our bills. Well, he was just, yeah, yeah. you know, nowadays people mortgage their houses to go on vacation. You go on vacation. You're exactly right. But And, and I'll never forget mm -hmm. where I was sitting in the, in the living room and what he was said. I mean, my father was, you know, he was a young man. He was probably 40-something years old at the time. But it was really 
killing him that he had to mortgage the house not go bankrupt we've got this problem we're going to solve it so he was my number one I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And there there is another light bulb. I think you get the record. (laughs) That's good. How many light bulb moments? You appreciate the people that had influence on you, and you took the time to make a top 10 list, send it back to them, and and share that with them. Yeah. I mean, how how much do you think that meant to them? I don't know. I I, 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 I guarantee you it meant a lot. A few people actually responded and said, hey, I didn't know I meant that to you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, the The other, one of my favorites is Paul Hilliard who, of course, is a very successful oil and gas person here at the Hilliard Museum. Is that the Hilliard Museum? Okay. Hilliard yep. Museum. Yep. Paul and another colleague of his named Dick Campbell were both very successful uh, independent oil men. And I was with a firm that was working for both of them. And I was the the young guy who was doing the, the, the grunt work. And one day, Dick Campbell called me at home on a Sunday, which never caught me. It never bothered me. You know, came home from church and my wife said dick kim will call for you so i called him back he said can you meet me at my office in the morning sure he said it's time for you to leave that firm oh wow. and i'm gonna help you hell you now i want to talk to you so i went to their office the next morning and they were just sitting there said you know it's, it's time for you to go out on your own yeah what what did you bill us last year i, I think i said probably a hundred thousand a piece because they're huge clients mm-hmm. and they both said send us a bill and we'll pay you now for the year. <laughs> That's why. Which I didn't take them up on it because I didn't want to. Yeah. But with yeah. that kind of backing, I figured this is, yeah, know, I got to yeah, go yeah. for this. Yeah, they see something that you didn't even they see. They saw it. something in me that I didn't see in myself. That's incredible. In fact, and just the other day, Mr. Hilliard is, what, 98 years old now, I think. He just came out with this new book, Dauntless. Oh, my God. And my sister sent me a copy. He autographed a book to me, and he says, I hold you in high regard, Paul. And that just meant what does that mean to you? A lot you know? to me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that you're on, you're on somebody's top ten list too. Uh, well, I hope I am. I really yeah. hope. I hope I'm on my children's top ten list. Don't you though? That's, That's the one the that, best. That, that counts. That's the best. Yeah. How many? So how many? You had two I, daughters. I have two daughters. They both live here. And then how many grandkids? Four. Uh, the oldest is a uh, senior at Ascension. Mm-hmm. It's going to go to LSU in the fall. The second, uh, and he's the only child. The other three. I have a sophomore at Ascension, a uh, big basketball player, Christian Huggard. He uh, just made the – he started as a sophomore at Ascension. Wow. He's, in fact, he got the award last night at their banquet for an outstanding offensive player. That's great. And he has a sister who's in eighth grade at Ascension, and the little one is 10. Anderson is at Ascension also. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. Good school. Good, good school. Good family. I yep. love that. So, do you have a business tip that you'd like to share with uh, me? I'm not sure it's a tip, but one of the things that has worked for me very well is to see people as opportunities. Whether it's someone you want to invest with, yep. someone you want to hire. Uh, I I never had success hiring people using headhunters or want ads. I'm not saying those are not good resources. Sure. They just never worked for me. But what always worked for me was when I was introduced to someone, usually when I wasn't looking for a particular person, whether it's a client who said, you know, you, you really should talk to this young person or an employee who says, you know, I went to school with so-and-so, you really ought to meet them. Yeah. And when you meet people like that and, and it just – uh, it just works. And I, I don't know how many people I've hired over the years without a really job for them, but saying, you know, why don't you come on? Let's try this. I, I hate to keep doing this, but it's 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 another one because you're hiring for the person, not the position. Exactly. And, and it has worked for you. And it's worked for a lot of people that I've worked with. That's a great tip. Yeah, because, you know, you don't you don't know what's inside of people yeah. in terms of, yeah, you can look at their education and their work experience. But what's it? What's in their belly? How motivated are they? How bad do they want to succeed? What do they want to become? That's right. That's right. And you know, and sometimes you make a mistake and you hire the wrong person. But as I said, my best hires have always been people who I wasn't looking for. That is outstanding advice. You've come in contact with so many people, thousands and thousands mm-hmm. of people. How do you try to leave people different and better than you found them? The biggest thing you want to do is leave them feeling good about beating you. Yeah. Be fair, give them objective advice, uh, tell them what you feel that you want them to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear. And, uh, you know, 
maintain a high level of, of integrity. Yeah. You know, as I said a while ago, we all make mistakes. If you make a mistake, own up to it. Tell the client, look, I made a mistake. This is what we'll do to fix it. Or we can't fix it. This is so bad. We can't fix it. But I'm going to stand behind it and do everything I can. Yeah. I think the main thing I want people to remember is I was honest with them and didn't take advantage of them, charge a fair fee. And, you know, the, the term nickel and dime. Don't nickel and dime people. No doubt about it. Don't add, you know, 15 cents per copy to a bill <laughs> for $10,000 of a big project that you did for them. That's right. Because they'll see that. They'll see it and, and <laughs> yeah. they'll remember it. And it's like, yeah. didn't you get enough from the 10? Why did you have to charge me $30 for copies? Yeah. Thanks for joining us this week on I Finally Get It. To learn more about Ron and what he's up to, visit our show notes. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you're a business owner or entrepreneur and you have a light bulb moment that you think would help other business owners and entrepreneurs, reach out to me at jeff at ifinallygetit.com.